Hello and welcome to the third lecture in this series based around the Level 1 curriculum. Previous lectures have principally been concerned with image generation. And in this lecture, for the first time, we're going to be looking at interpreting those images. Before we start looking at any ultrasound clips, it's important to remember where Focus Ultrasound sits in patient assessment. In all likelihood, when you're performing a Focus Cardiac Ultrasound, you're doing it as part of a more comprehensive global patient assessment. And in this context, your echo should be considered as part of the physical examination. You should avoid making management decisions based solely on the echo findings, but integrate them into the patient's history, the remainder of the physical examination and other investigations. OK, so this lecture is titled Size and Function, and we're going to be considering the size, structure and function of both the left and right ventricles, as well as touching on the atria. Level 1 study is designed to be performed rapidly, and therefore there are intentionally few measurements within the minimum data set. Instead, sonographers are asked to eyeball or visually assess both size and function of many structures. In many ways, this is more difficult than performing a comprehensive scan where you have measurements to back up your assessment. So for that reason, I'm going to show some of the measurements performed in a comprehensive scan, even though you wouldn't necessarily be expected to perform these, to serve as a guide for your visual assessment. All right, so let's start by considering the left ventricle. So the shape of the LV cavity is frequently described as bullet-like where the basal and mid segments are cylindrical and the edges then taper in the shape of an ellipse towards the apex. In order for us to communicate the location of abnormalities more easily, there are standardised descriptors for the different regions of the left ventricle. The third of the LV closest to the mitral valve is referred to as the base, beyond that of the mid segments and then finally the apex. If normal cardiac geometry is preserved, then taking a slice through the LV cavity in its short axis will reveal an approximately circular cavity, albeit with trabeculations and papillary muscles projecting towards the centre. In addition to dividing the LV into basal, mid and apical segments, we use further divisions at each level, dividing the LV into anterior and inferior portions and describing the relationship to the intraventricular septum. Let's take this parasternal short axis view here at the level of the papillary muscles, so at the mid level. And let's pause this clip and start to divide the LV up. So if we start by identifying the intraventricular septum and draw lines that cut through the centre of the LV cavity using this as our starting point and then if we divide the intraventricular septum of a lateral wall in half we can describe the LV as having an anterior half with an, with an anteroseptal segment an anterior segment and an anterolateral segment and an inferior half with an inferoseptal segment, inferior segment and infralateral segment. These divisions are largely arbitrary but allow us to quickly communicate with each other as to where abnormalities have been detected. At the base of the LV we use these same six divisions, while at the apex the septum and lateral walls are not divided, so we have only four segments of the apex, the septal, anterior, lateral and inferior segments. It's possible for the same segments to be seen in multiple windows. And here you can see a parasternal short axis view and an apical four chamber view from the same patient with the arrow highlighting the mid inferoseptal wall in both cases. A common way of documenting abnormalities within regions of the left ventricle is by using a bullseye or target diagram. Here we have three rings where the outermost ring represents the basal third and the innermost ring represents the apex. A common reason to look for abnormalities within particular regions of the left ventricle is because the coronary arteries that supply the heart supply different segments of the left ventricle with a largely predictable pattern. Within the correct clinical context, identifying regional wall motion abnormalities may be a clue as to chronic or acute coronary artery disease. The left anterior descending artery usually supplies the anterior portions of the heart as well as the apex, whereas the circumflex artery supplies lateral segments, and the right coronary artery supplies inferior portions of the heart as well as the right ventricle free wall. As this diagram demonstrates, there is some potential overlap in coronary artery territories even within a normal population. The wall of the left ventricle is predominantly myocardium, sandwiched between the endocardial and pericardial layers. The myocardium consists of sheets of cardiac muscle fibres, arranged longitudinally along the long axis of the left ventricle, transversely along the short axis, as well as at oblique angles, such that when fibres shorten during systole, we observe thickening of the LV walls, with a decrease in the LV cavity diameter in the short axis, as well as a decrease in the overall length of the LV cavity 
and twisting and rotation movements. The combination of all of these movements results in a decrease in LV cavity size during systole, and our assessment of the change in volume over the cardiac cycle forms one of our key assessments of LV systolic function. Alright, now that we've considered the structure of a normal left ventricle, let's have a look at some ultrasound images and think about how we're going to assess and describe size. When looking at the left ventricle, the first thing that I ask my trainees to consider is left ventricular wall thickness. Typically the first view that we'll get of the heart is from a parasternal long axis view, and this view particularly lends itself to assessment of LV wall thickness, as both the intraventricular septum and the infralateral wall line up perpendicular to the ultrasound beam. When performing a comprehensive study, we'll measure the wall thickness at the end of diastole using either M mode or in a frozen 2D clip. So here we have a 2D clip that's been frozen just at the onset of systole. The mitral valve leaflets are just beginning to close and the aortic valve remains firmly closed. Now if we create an imaginary line that sits at right angles to the LV walls running through the base of the LV cavity just beyond the mitral valve leaflet tips. This is the point at which we'll measure the LV wall thickness. In this patient, both the intraventricular septum and the LV infralateral wall measured approximately 8 mm. This value is comfortably within the normal range, regardless of which association's guidelines you're using. Now whilst it may not be necessary for you to measure left ventricle wall thickness, I think it is important for the level 1 sonographer to be able to recognise left ventricular hypertrophy, especially when it's severe, as it is here in the case on the right, in a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. As well as LVH being a clue to underlying heart disease, when severe it can be hemodynamically significant, especially in patients with hypovolemia, where obstruction of the flow through the left ventricular outflow tract can occur. We'll touch on this again in the lecture on valvular heart disease, where we'll be using colour flow mapping for the first time. Now, there are features on the 2D echo which may give the experienced echocardiographer a clue as to the cause of the increased wall thickness. But this level of detail is really quite far beyond that required for level 1 scans. And certainly for my own trainees, I always urge them to simply report the presence of increased wall thickness and try not to speculate too much on the likely cause unless they've got extra clues from the patient's history and examination. Next, let's consider the size of the LV cavity. And we're going to introduce one of the measurements that we really should be doing every time for a level 1 scan. And that's the left ventricle internal diameter at end diastole taken from the parasternal long axis view. Now we can either do this from a frozen 2D clip or if the alignment allows from an M mode image. Let's have a look at a 2D clip first. So here we have our Plax view. I'm going to freeze the image and scroll through to end diastole. So this is exactly the same frame that we would have used to measure the LV wall thickness if we were making that measurement. So once again, we're at the end of diastole, the onset of systole, so the ECG marker is going to be probably around about the upstroke of the R wave. The mitral valve leaflets should just be starting to close with the onset of systole, and the aortic valve must clearly be closed. And once again, we need to imagine a line that runs through the LV walls, perpendicular to the LV walls, that lies just beyond the leaflet tips of the mitral valve. And this is where we're going to make our measurement. And this measurement should be made from the internal border of the LV cavity, from the intraventricular septum down to the infralateral wall. So this measurement can be easy enough when you have clearly defined borders. But frequently when performing level 1 scans you'll have suboptimal imaging conditions which will inevitably lead to suboptimal images. Let's consider this clip where we can see the intraventricular septum relatively well but the infralateral wall is less well shown. And so if we freeze this clip at end diastole it can sometimes be challenging to see exactly where to measure to. A common mistake made by sonographers just starting out is only measuring as far as the subvalvular apparatus connected to the posterior mitral valve leaflet. And actually what we need to do is extend through these until we reach the infralateral wall. Another mistake I see commonly amongst my own trainees is to measure beyond the infralateral wall, coming all the way down to the bright pericardium. So that's measuring the LVIDD using 2D imaging. How does the technique differ when we're using M-mode? So this is an M-mode graph taken from a parasand long axis view and you can see that the dotted lines in the thumbnail, which represents the cursor, pass reasonably perpendicular through the LV walls. So any measurement we make of the LV cavity here is going to be very slightly, but only very slightly exaggerated. Again, the ECG trace is essential because that's going to help us time when to make our measurement. And if you identify the intraventricular septum in the 
middle of the image and the infralateral wall in the far field, you can see how both of these structures both thicken and move in towards the centre of the LV cavity during systole. And the measurement that we need to make is the cavity diameter just before they come together. Here our normal ranges vary by gender. And so for men we're going to allow up to 56mm and for women up to 51mm. For men, our threshold for labelling the LV internal diameter as severely dilated is going to be 65mm and for women 59mm. So that's using a single one dimensional measurement and extrapolating that measurement to describe the entire LV cavity size. Of course, if that measurement isn't representative of the LV as a whole, then it may be their significant dilatation, even if the LV cavity diameter doesn't seem particularly abnormal. So it's important that as well as taking that measurement, we also look at the LV in all of the views that we obtain and consider the size and the shape of the cavity. So whilst in a level one scan we don't make any more measurements, I think it is helpful to understand what measurements can be made in a comprehensive scan. Because I think this gives you an idea of what it is you're supposed to be visually assessing in the other views. So one of the measurements that's almost always made is an estimate of left ventricular end diastolic volume using the Simpsons method of discs. And I'll quickly demonstrate how this method works, not because you're expected to perform this, but because you're expected to do something visually that's analogous to making this measurement. So the Simpsons biplane method utilizes two apical views, the apical four chamber and apical two chamber, but we're only gonna produce an apical four chamber view in our level one study. So let's see how this would work if we were just doing it in one plane rather than in two. So here's our apical four chamber, and we've zoomed in a little bit on the left ventricle, you can see we're cutting off the bottom of the left atrium. Now we want to assess the diastolic volume, the end diastolic volume, so we're going to freeze the image at end diastole. Now we're going to trace the outline of the LV cavity. Starting at the septal mitral valve hinge point, we're going to trace up the intraventricular septum, around the apex, and then down the lateral wall, again finishing at the hinge point of the mitral valve. And our ultrasound machine is going to create a grid over our LV cavity with a line running down the centre of the cavity in the long axis, as we can see here. The software is going to then imagine that there are 20 discs placed one on top of each other, with each disc having an identical height, 1 20th of the length of the LV cavity. The diameter of each disc is different, and each disc's diameter depends on the distance between the septal and lateral walls. The software then calculates the volume of each disc independently and sums these volumes to give an estimate of the LV cavity volume. Alright, so whilst you won't be performing this measurement in your level 1 studies, I think it's helpful to see how in a comprehensive study we convert a two-dimensional area into an estimate of a three-dimensional volume. I think it's also useful to see how those discs in the basal and mid two-thirds of the LV cavity have got broadly equivalent diameters and how the discs taper as they reach towards the apex in a very characteristic fashion. Okay, so we've got an approach for assessing left ventricular size. Now let's move on and look at left ventricular systolic function. Now before we do, there's a few things we need to consider each time we're looking at the heart that's going to allow us to put our assessment of ventricular function into context. All of these apply equally to both the left and right heart. I'm going to go through them here before we touch on the left ventricle, but we need to consider them as well when we're thinking about the right ventricle. So firstly, what's the heart rate and rhythm? We can take this from the bedside monitor or the ECG on the ultrasound machine. Is a patient in an irregular rhythm, such as AF? Well, if they are, then they're going to have variable filling times between each systole, which means that before each contraction, there'll be a different amount of blood within the left ventricle, a different amount of preload. And this is going to impact on how much blood is ejected forward. What's the rate? Is the heart going so fast that there's no time to fill? Or is it so slow that, even though the volume of blood that's ejected seems adequate, the overall cardiac output, which is a product of the stroke volume and heart rate, doesn't meet the body's demands. Secondly, let's have a look at how the patient's being ventilated. Are they breathing spontaneously and unaided? In which case they're breathing with what we call negative pressure ventilation, they're generating a negative pressure in the chest that sucks gases in. Are they on some kind of ventilatory support, either invasive or non-invasive? If we're applying PEEP to the patient, as a general rule, this tends to favour left ventricular systolic dysfunction. It decreases afterload on the left ventricle but can sometimes have a negative impact on the right ventricle. Is a patient on any cardiovascular support? Are they on an inotrope infusion? If a patient's on an infusion of a positively inotropic agent, 
what might look like normal function probably represents quite an impaired ventricle, which really should be working quite hard in that context. Is there any mechanical circulatory support? If there is, this is going to have a huge impact on preload, afterload and contractility depending on the type of support. And you probably need to be asking whether or not you're the best person to assess a ventricle in that context. That probably is going to require someone with a bit more experience. And finally, but probably should be firstly, what's the patient's clinical condition? There'll be times when you see patients with very low ejection fractions in clinic who have adapted their oxygen demands such that they decrease supply is adequate in that context. Likewise, you'll sometimes see patients who appear to have, for example, a moderately impaired ventricle but are exceptionally unwell. And in the context of a disease such as sepsis, when you'd hope that the circulation would increase its supply to meet the increased demand, any decrease in supply here is going to be very abnormal and should be highlighted as so. OK, so let's take a tour through our left ventricle. And as we do so, we're going to ask the following questions. Do the LV walls thicken and do they move? It's important to realise that akinetic segments of the left ventricle will still move if they're tethered to healthy segments that pull them along. If there is motion, in which direction is it and is it synchronous? And how do the LV cavity dimensions change over the course of the cardiac cycle? Which is ultimately what we're trying to see. What we want to know is that during systole, the volume of blood inside the left ventricle decreases as that blood is ejected forward to the rest of the body. Alright, let's start with the parastatal long axis and here we have four LV segments on view. In the far field we have the basal and mid infralateral wall and closer to the near field we have the interventricular septum and more specifically the basal and mid anteroceptal segments. So let's ask our first question, are these walls thickening? And what we want to see is a 50% thickening from diastolic thickness to systolic thickness. You don't need to measure this thickening. Seeing lots of examples of normal and abnormal hearts is going to allow you to recognise this quite quickly. If there's some thickening but it's reduced, then we're going to term this segment hypokinetic. And if it doesn't thicken at all or negligibly thickens, we're going to call that akinetic. We also need to assess the direction of movement of a wall. It should be travelling in towards the centre of the LV cavity. If it's moving in the wrong direction, if it's moving away from the centre of the cavity, then we'll term this dyskinetic. So in our healthy volunteer here, if the LV walls are thickening and they're moving, they're moving in towards the centre of the cavity in systole. And together this is bringing about a change in LV cavity size. We can visually assess this, but if we wanted to put a number to this change in cavity over the course of the cardiac cycle, we can measure the fractional shortening. This can be done either from a 2D video clip or from an M-mode graph taken through the LV cavity perpendicular to the LV walls. To measure fractional shortening, measure the LV cavity diameter just beyond the mitral valve tips and then diastole, and then advance to peak systole where the cavity is at its narrowest, and now measure the LV cavity diameter again at the same point. The percentage decrease in LV cavity diameter over the course of the cardiac cycle is termed fractional shortening. We're looking to see a change in cavity diameter of at least 25%, with a change of less than 15%, suggesting severe LV impairment. So you can see in this example from a healthy volunteer, we've got fractional shortening of 39%. By contrast, this MO graph is taken from a, another female patient of a similar age who has an acute septic cardiomyopathy with fractional shortening of just 18%. Another observation you can make, which may give you a clue as to the LV systolic function, is how much the mitral valve opens during diastole. So assuming that the mitral valve is structurally normal, there's no mitral stenosis, and that there's no significant aortic regurgitation that might prevent the mitral valve from opening as a high-velocity jet is angled against it, then failure of the mitral valve to open fully may reflect an extreme low flow state with significantly reduced ejection fraction. Let's have a look at these two images here side by side. On the left we have a healthy volunteer, and on the right a patient with a dilated cardiomyopathy. And on the right, there's no significant mitral valve structural disease. You don't have to take my word for it, but there's no significant aortic regurgitation. And early in diastole, when the mitral valve should be flung open by the blood rushing from the LA into the LV, well, we're just not seeing that. We'll usually only assess this visually. But in a comprehensive study, we might quantify this failure of the anterior mitral valve leaflet to reach the septum, which we call E-point septal separation, EPSS where the E stands for early diastole. In healthy volunteers, we see that the anterior mitral valve leaflet reaches within 5mm of the septum, 
but this distance has increased in patients with a variety of cardiac diseases which reduce the ejection fraction. Now let's turn our attention to the parasternal short axis. So one of the great things about viewing the left ventricle from this window is that as we pan up and down the ventricle, tilting the probe from a more medial position to a more lateral position, we get to observe all of the LV segments, from the basal segments around the level of the mitral valve, through to the mid segments at the level of the papillary muscles, and then finally the apex. The assessments we're going to make at each level are similar, therefore I'm going to discard the basal and apical levels, and we're just going to concentrate on the mid for a second. OK, so you want to make an assessment of overall LV function, and what you're really doing is taking a look at the area of the LV cavity at end diastole, and then seeing how this changes over the course of the cardiac cycle to end systole. The greater the change in the area, the greater the proportion of blood that will be ejected from the left ventricle. A quick and easy way to do this is to hold your hand up in front of the screen, place your outstretched index finger in front of the centre of the LV cavity, and just get a feel for how well those walls are moving in towards you. Once you've done this, you need to have a look for regional wall motion abnormalities. Take the time to move your eye around the entire circumference of the left ventricle, ensuring that each segment is working as well as the next. If it helps, you can again use your hand to isolate individual segments and really scrutinise them properly. Here we've isolated the mid infraceptal segment and can see that it both thickens and moves towards the centre of the LV cavity during systole. Move your eye around the entire circumference of the LV using your hand to block out areas you're not concentrating on, if you find that helpful, and ensure that for every segment, it's visible throughout the entire cardiac cycle, thickens at least 40-50% to 50 and moves towards the centre synchronously. Remember that a major reason why we do this is to look for evidence of coronary artery disease. If you do identify regional wall motion abnormalities, ask yourself how the distribution of the abnormalities that you've discovered correlate to the territory supplied by the different coronary arteries. Alright, let's take a look at an example. So in this parasternal short axis image at the mid-level, I would argue that the anterior septal and anterior segments have the best function, whilst there's very little thickening of motion in any of the other segments. And indeed, this is from a patient with a previous inferior myocardial infarction who's acutely occluded their left circumflex. This patient is entirely dependent on segments supplied by the LAD for their LV systolic function. As we move around to the apical four chamber view, we have another opportunity to assess both global and regional systolic function. As the aortic valve is not on view, we must now be looking at the inferoceptal wall and opposite that the anterolateral wall, from the base in the far field up to the apex in the near field. Consider both the overall change in LV cavity size, as well as running your eye around all the visible segments to look for regional motion abnormalities. When considering LV cavity size, we've already described how the Simpsons method can be used to estimate volume at end diastole. And when estimating ejection fraction from 2D images, we use the Simpsons method again to estimate the end systolic volume, with the difference in these two volumes being our stroke volume and our ejection fraction being the proportion of the LV diastolic volume that is ejected. Just to reiterate, I'm not expecting anyone to perform a Simpsons biplane estimate of ejection fraction when doing a focus study. But what I think is helpful is to see a wide range of left ventricles with various degrees of systolic impairment and to build up an internal library of what normal looks like as well as a sort of internal library of mild, moderately and severely impaired ventricles. So this apical four chamber view on the left is taken from a healthy volunteer whose ejection fraction is well within the normal range. Let's take a look at some impaired ventricles. OK, so this first clip is taken from a young patient who'd just been admitted to the intensive care unit with a suspected diagnosis of meningococcal meningitis that was later confirmed. So if you compare this back to the previous image that we looked at, this ventricle is globally impaired with an ejection fraction that's somewhere around about the 30% mark. Not only is this ventricle not particularly dynamic, this is a young patient with no pre-existing cardiac disease who's shocked, and you'd expect their ventricle to be doing a lot more in this circumstance. We monitored their heart with serial echocardiograms, and as their general condition improved, so did their ventricular function. This patient, by contrast, was far less unwell. They've presented to the ED with several months' history of progressive shortness of breath, and you can see that all four cardiac chambers are dilated, and the LV systolic function is severely depressed, with an ejection fraction of barely 10%. Despite the rather alarming image, this patient had good blood pressure, was passing urine and could be 
supported on just a small amount of supplemental oxygen, reflecting how the chronic nature of this impairment meant the patient had had time to adapt. There's one final assessment of left ventricular systolic function that I think is, is worth demonstrating here. That's having a look at how to assess longitudinal function or long axis function of the ventricle. So we've said that there are fibres arranged in a variety of orientations throughout the LV wall. And some fibres run lengthways along the long axis of the LV, such that when they shorten in systole, the mitral valve annulus is pulled laterally towards the apex. And in patients with LV impairment, severely reduced longitudinal function is one more marker of LV dysfunction. Here in this healthy volunteer I've marked both the septal and lateral components of the mitral valve annulus. And you can see how the whole annulus is pulled towards the apex during systole and then rapidly falls away in diastole. If we wanted to measure it, how would we do this? Well, we'd zoom in on the mitral valve annulus itself, place our cursor through the annulus and use M mode to track the annular movement over time. The y-axis dimension in millimetres is our MAPC. M-A-P-S-E, mitral annular plane systolic excursion. Numerous studies have shown a correlation between a reduced MAPC and a reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. Let's return to the apical four-chamber clip of our patient with a dilated cardiomyopathy, which demonstrates not only is the ejection fraction reduced, but there's almost no long axis function whatsoever. Okay, so that wraps up the left ventricle. Let's move on to the right ventricle. All right, so first let's consider the shape of the RV, which is often described as having complex geometry. In the simulated model on the right, the right ventricle appears as the blue structure, whilst the red mesh grid is the left ventricle. Medially, the intracardiac valves, and in theory, we have the tricuspid valve, whilst the pulmonary valve is the most superior and anterior of the four valves. The right ventricle wraps around the left ventricle. As we'll now see, the two dimensional views obtained in ultrasound are inadequate in accurately demonstrating the 3D structure. Let's have a look at how our standard focused echo views image the RV and get a sense of our limitations. So traditionally our first view is going to be the parastatal long axis and here we're just catching a small amount of right ventricular outflow tract just inferior to the pulmonary valve and you can see that the vast majority of the RV cavity lies inferior to our imaging plane. Nevertheless when there's severe RV dilatation then it's likely that we'll get some clues here with dilatation of the RV outflow tract and displacement of the intraventricular septum from right to left. Next we move round to the parasternal views and if we start at the level of great vessels we can see the most medial portion of the RV cavity from the tricuspid valve on the left of our image around to the RVOT and pulmonary valve on the right but now the majority of the RV cavity lies lateral to our imaging sector. The remainder of the parasternal short axis views also only show a small amount of the RV but one of the benefits of these views is they nicely show the intraventricular septum and if RV disease is causing displacement of the septum, this can be easily appreciated here. The apical four-chamber view is one of our most useful for imaging the right ventricle. It allows the LV and RV cavity to be seen side by side to allow direct comparisons. And as we'll see later on, one of the major determinants of the RV stroke volume is its longitudinal function, how much tricuspid annulus moves towards the apex during systole. And this is well demonstrated from this view. In the subcostal four-chamber view, we get to see the same structures that we see in the apical four-chamber view, but this time from inferiorly imaging through the liver. One of the advantages of this view is that the RV-free wall is roughly perpendicular to the ultrasound beam, and would therefore normally be our first choice view to assess RV wall thickness. Whilst we were discussing the left ventricle, we had a look at the various coronary artery supplies of the different left ventricle segments and so it's only fair that we quickly touch on the RV's blood supply. And so the first thing to say is that the intraventricular septum, while often considered and described as part of the LV, is shared between both ventricles and is essential for both. And as we described previously, the blood supply of the intraventricular septum is divided by the RCA at the more basal segments, and then the LAD more apically. The vast majority of the RV-free wall is going to be supplied by the right coronary artery with branches of the circumflex supplying parts of the RV free wall in a minority of patients. 
It's certainly not essential for the level 1 sonographer to have a detailed understanding of the blood supply of a right ventricle, but just to be aware that RV free wall ischemia may well complicate inferior myocardial infarction. An RV free wall rupture is a rare but recognised complication of this. Alright, so what assessment of a right ventricle do you need to make during your level 1 scan? Well, it's broadly similar to that of a left ventricle, so I guess you're going to be looking for ventricular wall hypertrophy, cavity size, and then systolic function. So hypertrophy is best assessed in the subcostal forechamber view if you can get a good window here. So in a focus study you're going to make a visual assessment, but if we were performing a comprehensive study and we wanted to quantify the degree of the RV wall thickness, then the way we'd do that would be to zoom in on the RV just about the level of the tricuspid valve when it's open. Pause our clip at end diastole and we measure the thickness here, with our normal range being up to 5mm. More useful for the level 1 sonographer is probably comparing a normal and an abnormal side by side. So here on the left we've got our healthy volunteer, whereas on the right we have a patient with chronic pulmonary hypertension secondary to COPD. The difference in RV wall thickness between these two images is striking, and if we zoom in on the abnormal image we can obtain a measurement of 8mm, clearly well outside the normal range. The list of causes of right ventricular hypertrophy are similar to the list for left ventricular hypertrophy and include hypertrophic cardiomyopathies and infiltrative disorders. However, in my own practice, the most common reason has got to be chronic raised pulmonary vascular resistance. Next, let's move on to how we estimate RV cavity size. And undoubtedly, the most useful view here is going to be the apical four-chamber view. A large proportion of the RV cavity is visible here, and in addition, it lines up right next to the LV, so we have something to compare it with. One important consideration, though, is how rotation of a probe can lead to apparent increase or decrease in the RV size. So when we're setting up for a standard apical four-chamber view, we place the orientation marker of the probe in the three o'clock position, so pointing off towards the patient's left. And the ultrasound beam slices through the centre of the LV cavity, as well as passing through the RV cavity, as is demonstrated here, where the green bars represent the apparent width of the respective cavities at the mid-level. Any anti-clockwise rotation of a probe here will cause the RV to appear to decrease in size and may lead you to underestimate the true RV cavity dimension. This is easily done, especially when you're trying to get the footprint of a probe to sit in the rib space. By contrast, rotating the probe clockwise will initially cause the RV to appear to increase in size. With the lack of available landmarks, it can be sometimes difficult to know exactly how you're cutting through the right ventricle. And indeed, in a comprehensive study, what we'll do is try and maximise the width of the right ventricle by adjusting the rotation. And it's from these RV focus views that the normal ranges have been derived. When you're performing a focus study, your image is going to be much more like the central image. And rather than taking measurements, you'll be comparing the left and the right sides and assessing their relative size. So this is an apical four-chamber view from a healthy volunteer. And we can see that the RV appears to be much smaller than the LV in this clip. If you want to be certain, let's pause the video and find end diastole. As a general rule of thumb, the RV area should be less than two-thirds that of the LV area. It's not essential to measure this, you can just do this visually. You can also notice how the LV makes up all of the apex. Now, as the RV dilates, not only will its relative size increase, but it may start to share the apex of the left ventricle, or even take over. So now that we've seen a normal, let's have a look at some abnormal cases for comparison. So this is a patient who's known to have LV dysfunction, but just a couple of weeks ago had an echo that showed a normal right ventricle. Certainly it was reported as being normal in size and systolic function. And this patient has a collapse, and a CTPA has confirmed an acute pulmonary embolus. And to my eye, if this right ventricle isn't as large as the left ventricle, then it's certainly nearly that size, and undoubtedly dilated. This clip is taken from a patient with pulmonary hypertension of unknown etiology, and now the RV is very much larger than the LV, and has taken over the apex. An important consideration when you are deciding whether or not the RV is dilated by comparing it to the LV is how to compensate for the fact that the left ventricle itself may be dilated. So in this patient the LV appears far larger than the RV, but actually this patient has dilatation of all four cardiac chambers, and in absolute terms, the RV is also dilated. It just appears relatively normal in size when compared to the massive left ventricle. 
So our spherical four chambers give you our most useful view in establishing RV dilatation. We may get some important clues from some of the other views that we use in focused echocardiography. So if we have a look at two parastern long axis views here, on the left a healthy volunteer and on the right a patient with pulmonary hypertension due to recurrent PEs. And we can see how the diameter of the RV outflow tract is significantly greater in our unwell patient. These two parastenal short axis clips are taken from the exact same two subjects and we can observe the great distance between the aortic valve and the RV free wall anteriorly as a clue that the patient on the right has significant RV dilatation. Alright, so we've brought up the parasternal window, we're talking about RV cavity volume. Then let's just spend a couple of minutes talking about the position of the intraventricular septum and how this can give us a clue to RV pathology. So the two sides of the heart share a relatively fixed space, at least in the acute setting, bounded by the pericardium. Changes on one side of the heart are going to impact on the other side. And we can use the relative position of the intraventricular septum as a guide to this. So these two images are from our healthy volunteer and they show the normal position of the septum such that in both diastole and in systole, the septum is displaced from the left towards the right, causing the LV to have a approximately circular shape. So in the healthy individual, the ventricular diastolic pressure is low in both the right and left ventricles, and this makes sense because we want to encourage filling of the heart, and elevation of the diastolic pressure is going to prevent that. And actually, LV and RV and diastolic pressure are not too dissimilar in our normal subjects. But what if you have a situation where you have an acute increase in RV volume? And the classic example of this is pulmonary embolus. So RV volume increases because we can't move the blood forward into the pulmonary circulation as well as we once could, and therefore RV diastolic pressure increases. The pericardium can't stretch acutely, and therefore we see displacement of the intraventricular septum from right to left. So when we see flattening of the intraventricular septum in diastole, we typically associate that with RV volume overload. We've seen an increase in RV diastolic pressure, but that doesn't necessarily translate to an increase in RV systolic pressure. We know that the normal RV free wall is thin, and when we see acute rises in pulmonary vascular resistance such as we do in pulmonary embolus, the RV free wall just doesn't have the muscle bulk to generate exceptionally high pressures, certainly nothing like the normal left ventricular systolic pressures. So during systole, the normal relationship between high LV systolic pressure and relatively low RV systolic pressure is restored. And this means that during systole we get a circular RV cavity. If flattening of intraventricular septum persists into systole, this suggests that the RV systolic pressure is relatively elevated. And in the case demonstrated here, we have a patient who has acute pulmonary embolus but on the background of years of chronic PEs. And so this patient is used to having to deal with high pulmonary vascular resistance chronically and are able to generate higher RV systolic pressures such that they have both volume and pressure overload. If we want to put a number to this cavity distortion, we can use the eccentricity index. This is the ratio of the anterior to posterior dimension of the LV cavity to the septal to lateral dimension. How do we do this in practice? So we get our parasternal short axis view, and we pause our clip at the portion of the cardiac cycle we're interested in, so either end diastole or end systole, and we take two measurements at right angles to each other. The first from the anterior down to the inferior walls, and the second from the septal to the lateral. A normal eccentricity index is approximately one, with higher values representing a greater degree of distortion. These grossly abnormal images are taken from a patient with long-standing severe pulmonary hypertension. Let's have a look at a much less extreme example. So, this image on the right hand side of the screen is taken from a young patient with severe respiratory failure with no pre existing medical conditions. They've got an end diastolic eccentricity index of 1.2, demonstrating that there is some displacement of the interventricular septum from right to left, but much less pronounced than in our previous case. To give you a frame of reference, this study performed in stable outpatients looked at patients with known RV volume overload undergoing simultaneous echocardiogram and pulmonary artery catheter measurements. And these patients had septal flattening during diastole with a mean eccentricity index of 1.26, but only those who had elevated pulmonary pressures during their right heart cath had septal flattening that persisted into systole, whereas the normal ventricular shape was restored in systole in those with pulmonary pressures of less than 40 mm mercury. Alright, let's move on to RV systolic function. And it's worth remembering once again 
that everything we said about putting our assessment of the LV systolic function into context applies equally to the RV. And with the RV in particular, we want to pay special attention to how the patient is ventilating. Is it spontaneous, i.e. negative pressure, or are they on some form of ventilatory support? Now, when thinking about RV systolic function, I ask my trainees to consider the longitudinal function or long axis function and radial function separately, and then combine both of these to come up with an overall assessment. Of the two, it's the longitudinal function that contributes the most to change in RV cavity size over the course of the cardiac cycle. And so let's start with that. The best place to visualise the RV longitudinal function is going to be your apical four-chamber view. And here you can see I've highlighted the lateral portion of the tricuspid annulus. And we can observe as it moves sharply up towards the apex during systole, and then it has two downwards descents. The first during early diastolic filling, followed by a second smaller descent that occurs during atrial systole. So we can quantify the magnitude of this movement towards the apex. We're going to call this our TAPSE, T-A-P-S-E, Tricuspid Annular Plane Systolic Excursion. And this is one of the few measurements that appears in the BSC Level 1 minimum data set. And you should get in the habit of performing this measurement every time the image quality allows. So to perform a TAPSE measurement first, zoom in on the tricuspid annulus. And you want to get in as close as you can without the annulus ever leaving the 2D box that you've created. Place your cursor through the annulus, making sure that you can still see the tricuspid valve leaflets. It's very easy to tilt the probe here and lose the leaflets and be, and be imaging the wrong structure without being aware of it. Once you're happy that you're cutting through the annulus, create an MMO graph. Use a thumbnail to make sure that you're happy that you know which part of the graph represents the most apical edge of the annulus. And measure the change in position over the course of systole. Your ultrasound machine software will be aware that you're trying to measure a distance, and so it will only quote the y-axis component, and so the angle of your slope is immaterial. Once again, as with all measurements made from MMO graphs, it's important to track a single line, and a common mistake is to jump between different structures, which usually results in exaggerating the true value. So for TAPSI, our cutoff for abnormal is going to be any value below 17 millimetres. Let's have a look at some abnormal hearts and see how they compare to our healthy volunteer. So this patient has both LV and RV impairment. Without doing any measurements, the RV looks to be dilated. And in fact, this is a patient with an acute PE on a background of pre-existing heart disease. If we zoom in on the tricuspid valve and measure the TAPSI, we get a value of just 11 millimetres, well below the lower limit of our reference range. And this adds weight to our assertion that this right ventricular systolic impairment. This next clip is from a patient with known pulmonary hypertension who is now presented septic and is in mixed cardiogenic and vasoplegic shock, supported by a number of vasoactive infusions. As a marker of just how poor their cardiac output is, you can see a number of small bubbles within the right atrium and right ventricle, which in a healthy heart would be quickly washed into the pulmonary circulation. These will have been introduced through one of the patient's IV infusions, probably a bag of fluids, and are a normal finding when imaging sick patients. Can we quantify just how bad this RV's longitudinal function is? Well, if we zoom in on the tricuspid valve and take our TAPSI measurement, we get a value of barely 5 millimetres. The apical four-chamber view is also a reasonable place to have a look at the radial function of the RV. And here we can see the free wall coming in towards the septum during systole. In addition, we can use the parasternal windows and assess the degree of radial contractility in the RVOT. So here we have two parasternal long axis clips. On the left we have our healthy volunteer and on the right we have a patient with significant RV systolic impairment. And both of these clips have been slowed down to play back at 50% normal speed. First concentrate on the image on the left, which shows normal radial contractility at the RVOT. Once you're happy that you've seen an example of normal radial contractility, turn your attention to the image on the right. And notice how the degree of movement in towards the septum is greatly reduced in this example. Now let's have a look at some examples from the parasternal short axis at the level of the aortic valve. So once again the image on the left is taken from a healthy volunteer and the image on the right is taken from a patient with pathology. And what I want you to concentrate on is the distance between the most anterior portion of the aortic valve annulus and the RV free wall anterior to this, so everything in the near field. And watch how the diameter of the RVOT decreases during systole on the left, but there's far less decrease in the diameter in the patient with RV systolic impairment in the clip on the right. Once you've assessed the RV's longitudinal and radial function, you're going to combine these two assessments to give a qualitative description of the overall RV systolic function.
When performing a comprehensive study, one quantitative measurement we can make that reflects this overall function is RV fractional area change, which is the percentage decrease in RV area across the course of the cardiac cycle, as measured in the apical four-chamber view. And in one study, this was shown to correlate well with the RV ejection fraction as measured by near-simultaneous cardiac MRI. When this measurement is made, what we do is we freeze the the apical four-chamber view and end diastole, trace the inner border of the RV from the lateral annulus of the tricuspid valve up to the apex and back down to the septal annulus of the tricuspid valve, and then take a second area measurement at peak systole. Our cutoff for abnormal being less than 30% in males or 35% in females. So in our healthy volunteer here, we have a fractional area change of 44%, comfortably within the normal range. For contrast, let's have a look at a sick RV. Okay, so we've seen this clip before. This patient has lots of abnormalities. But if we're concentrating on the right ventricle, the shape is abnormal, the size is abnormal, it's clearly dilated, and there's a reduction in both longitudinal and radial function. And when I zoomed in on the right ventricle and measured the fractional area change, I got a value of approximately 15%, which is consistent with severe RV impairment. Alright, so way back at the beginning of this video lecture, I mentioned we would touch on the atria. And whilst we are going to do that, we're not going to get too bogged down in the minutiae, as I think that might distract from some of the video lecture's main teaching objectives. So having a look at the atria could be really useful, because the circulation works in series. And so an abnormality at any point in the circulation can cause both upstream and downstream, particularly downstream, knock-on effects. So therefore atrial dilatation may give us a clue as to an abnormality somewhere else within the heart. So this is another example where, in the context of a focused echo, taking time to make measurements of atrial size is probably counterproductive. And all you're asked to do here is make a qualitative assessment of whether or not there's any gross abnormality. Probably the most useful thing to do now is to have a look at some examples side by side of a normal patient compared to some patients with pathology. So here on the left is our healthy volunteer, and on the right we have a patient with coronary artery disease, severe bordering on torrential mitral regurgitation, and a very enlarged left atrium. You can and should consider atrial size in all of the available views, but your apical four-chamber view is usually going to be one of the most useful, as it lines up nicely for side-by-side -side comparisons. So this next example is particularly extreme. This is from a patient with severe mitral stenosis. You can see right at the top of the image is the left ventricle, and around the level of the focus point is a mitral valve, which is barely opening. Here, the left atrium fills almost the entire imaging sector. In addition to considering atrial size, take a moment to have a look at the position of the interatrial septum. So in the same way that the intraventricular septum's position is dictated by the pressure on either side, the same is true for the interatrial septum. In healthy individuals, right atrial pressure tends to be slightly lower than that of the left atrium, but the difference is negligible, and the interatrial septum sits between the two, moving gently to and fro between the left and the right. If we zoom in on the atria, we can observe this more closely. So here we can see the septum moving back and forth, and if we pause the image we can see that here it's clearly deviating from the left towards the right. But then if we allow the clip to advance to mid-systole, we can see that there's now a subtle right-to-left bowing of the septum, and this is the normal appearance. OK, let's have a look at a couple of patients with this pathology. So on the left, this is a patient who's had lower limb trauma and has acutely deteriorated, and the echo provides us with some clues as to why. We can see that the RV is dilated, the function is impaired, the RA is dilated, and the intraatrial septum is fixed, bowing from right to left. A CTPA confirmed that this patient has had an acute pulmonary embolus. And the particularly observant of you may have noticed there's a bright structure in the centre of the right ventricle, which in the clinical context may well be thrombus. The patient on the right, by contrast, has bowing of the intraatrial septum from left to right. This patient has got a particularly high left atrial pressure. This patient was an acute pulmonary edema due to torrential MR and made a good recovery following surgical mitral valve repair. Alright, so I think that's probably plenty to be getting on with. So why don't we summarise some of the things that we've discussed in this lecture and make sure that the key learning points are clear. So first of all, never treat the echo in isolation. A focused echo is part of a broader patient assessment that's going to take in the history, physical examination and investigations. As you're preparing to perform your scan, take a look around the bed space. Can you see any factors that influence how the heart's likely to be performing? 
Have a look at the monitor. What's the heart rate? What's the rhythm? Is the patient on any vasoactive infusions that are going to influence myocardial performance? When you're performing your scan, what things do you need to look at? We need to have a look at the wall thickness and make a visual assessment, certainly for the left ventricle and if you're feeling confident, then also for the right ventricle. Have a look at both ventricular cavities of either normal shape, so that's a bullet shape for the left ventricle and triangular for the right. Is there any ventricular dilatation? And for the left ventricle, this is one of the places where you are going to make a measurement. In the parasternal long axis, get in the habit of measuring the left ventricle end diastolic diameter, as we showed how to do earlier. Consider the function of both ventricles, both globally and regionally. And for the right ventricle, measure the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion, or TAPSI, in the apical forechamber view. And finally, have a think about the atria. Are they normal size? And is there fixed bowing of the septum in either direction? Record all of your findings either on a bespoke report or within the patient's medical record. And if you're not the healthcare professional primarily responsible for the patient, make sure you feed back to whoever is. Okay, so I hope that was useful. And in the next video lecture, we're going to cover colour Doppler and valvulopathies.